Okay, sorry you guys. So somebody like reported over and over again my skincare video and they took it down and then just now sent me a thing that said, so sorry we got this wrong, which means for about, every time that happens, every time that happens, it'll go now like six weeks or something and they won't take any videos down. So the good news about like it happening is now when people report and report and report my videos, Facebook will ignore it. <laughs> that's the one good thing that we've noticed is like if we get a video that's taken down while I'm live because somebody's reporting it over and over and they rule in my favor, it takes forever for them to ever take another video down. Like literally six or eight weeks. So <clears throat> this video is just very appropriately titled like the difference between malicious intent and shit happens is my way of just kind of addressing like I'm getting like photographs and screenshots of where some girl that I don't even recall is claim that she worked for Jacob and I and first and foremost I want to address that um 90% of what she says has no truth to it but the other 10% that has truth um yeah like let's talk about it I mean having the horses in Pitkin, Louisiana was so hard on me because I could only be at the facility maybe two to three days a week and it would be two to three days a week and it would just be for a couple of hours. So once upon a time, I got the idea that I was going to hire somebody that could be there every other day or every day through the week that could, um, and I seem to recall that it was Monday through Friday and then not there on Saturday or Sunday to just go through the pins and find all of the horses that were injured or doctored because Dr. Horner used to come on Mondays and Thursdays. So that's how I know a little bit of their story isn't right because I recall it was five days a week because Dr. Horner would be there on Mondays and Thursdays and they could just have like we had a pin that we just basically called like you know like Ted's pin. I never called it the hospital pin. It was called Ted's pin. And anything that had something wrong with it, whether it be strangles or a snake bite or whatever, would go in that pin so that Ted, when he came on Monday or Thursday, would go directly to that pin and start there. I think what bothers me about this the most is it's proof that even when I didn't own the pins and I, um, like issue being able to be there. It was over an hour away. I was having to basically borrow a vehicle from Jacob to get there because I didn't even have my own vehicle at the time. Um, that I was still trying to find somebody to do what's best for the horses. And I will tell you why that person was fired. Gary called me one day and he said, this, this cannot continue to go on. And, and Gary said, there's a difference between somebody who wants to help the horses and somebody who just wants drama. And I said, what's going on? And he said, a horse came in here, I think, that has tetanus. And he said, it came in on Tuesday. And Thursday before Ted could get here, it was dead. So it came in Tuesday afternoon. It means it stood Wednesday. Ted was supposed to see it Thursday morning when he got there. It was dead. And Gary said, I'm not the one that dumped this horse off at the cell barn with tetanus. And I said, I know that. He said, how come this lady is freaking out on me that this horse is dead? I'm not the one that dumped it at the cell barn like this. And I said, well... I think people like that have the mentality that the moment that you saw it at the cell barn, you should have thrown it in the trailer and rushed it to a vet clinic. And he was like, it's a $200 horse. And I said, I understand it's a $200 horse. And I said, when you bought it, did you know it had tetanus? And he was like, it was pretty sweaty in the ring, but it's a thoroughbred. So I just, I thought it was like just super worked up, you know, about like a new environment. He was like, it wasn't until we got at home that we realized, like, it had a lot of muscle tremors. And then I asked him, who told you it had tetanus? And he was like, well, she did. 
And I said, are you sure? Or does it have like PSSM? Or are you sure it's a thoroughbred and not a, not a different breed? Like there's other... I said, tetanus, its third eye would have been closed over. And I remember, I remember having this conversation over the phone with Gary and this girl, this lady is like screaming in the background that this horse died of tetanus. And I, when he finally put her on the phone, I said, listen, I'm so sorry, but like your job here is over. You know, unfortunately you're just going to have to leave. You know, I can't continue to employ you whenever basically <laughs> Gary, um, you know, basically when Gary said that you can't stay at his property because instead of just going around doing your job, working with the vet to do what's best for the horses, like you, you can't handle it. And I told her, I don't blame you for not being able to handle. And then she started saying, well, this horse should have seen an emergency vet. And I said, well, why don't you call the cell barn and figure out who dropped the horse off at the cell barn and see if, if they want to pursue charges. And that's when she started yelling at me that I was a piece of shit and that I needed to get off my lazy fucking ass and get to the pins and do, you know, do more. And I told her, I can't. I physically um, am able, obviously, but like financially and where we live and with the situation, like I can't. And then she started yelling at me that she had the day before um, been so overwhelmed with trying to get him to drink. I'll never forget this. I spent seven hours trying to get this horse to drink. And I told her the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Like you can stand there for seven hours, bawling your head off, being fucking insane, but it's not going to make the horse drink. I said, did you call the vet and ask them if you could pick up a catheter in fluids? Well, no. And I said, well, you have the vet's number. If you thought the horse was not drinking and dehydrated, you know, Ted is always available. Did you call and tell him you had an emergency? No. And I said, well, okay. And she said, so you're blaming me. You're blaming me. And she was like, you're a fucking piece of shit. Blaming me, blaming me. And I said, I'm not blaming you. I said, I'm not blaming you any more than you're blaming Gary. And she goes, it is his fault. It's his fault. And I said, it's not his fault. He brought the horse home from the cell with something clearly wrong with it. I said, and the vet is scheduled to be there in an hour and it's dead. And you spent seven hours yesterday with the horse trying to get it to drink? This was years ago. This was like seven years ago. This was seven years ago. Anyway, I'll just never forget those little key points because you can stand with a horse for seven hours, but that's not going to force them to drink. And she said that she got so overwhelmed that she forgot to check the weather and that all of the doctoring supplies got rained on. And I told her, why didn't you move them into my horse trailer? And she started screaming, because they're not yours. They're not yours for you to use on your horses. They're for my horses out here for me to doctor. They're not yours. And I said, I don't even, at the time, I didn't even own any personal horses. I said, you still could have put everything in my horse trailer to keep it out of the weather. And then again, she started screaming and hollering that they were not my supplies and I wasn't going to use them on my horses at my house. And I told her, I live in a hotel. Like I live in a hotel. What am I going to do? Put my horses in, in like the bathroom? Like I don't take that horse trailer from out there to my house and have horses. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I've seen the pictures in Oklahoma. And I told her I'm living in a hotel in Pineville, Louisiana. And I, four or five days a week, just do calls. And I was working my multi-level marketing business and it was actually built to an 80K team. And I was starting to finally make money on my own outside of horses. And this girl, I guess, has decided that seven years later, she wants to post in the group or whatever. First, she said there was another pony that I first want to reiterate that if what she had said was true, people were actually calling her out on it. Her lies. One lie was she said that this little emaciated Arabian that came in was the body score of one. She said he drowned in a puddle, that he got down and drowned in a puddle. So my response to her in, when I lived out there was, 
did you call Gary? And she said, no, because he is not going to hook him up to that tractor and drag him out of here alive. And I said, okay, well, not to be ugly, but I cannot help him unless you let Gary hook him up to the tractor. Like Gary's going to have to put him either in the bucket or put the hay forks on and stand him. And she was like, he's already dead. And I said, okay, well, before he died, did you call Gary and have him drive the tractor down and try to stand him? Well, no. And I said, okay, well, did you call Gary for the gun to shoot him and put him out of his misery? No. And then again, you're blaming me. You're blaming me. I said, I'm not blaming you. I said, the fucking horse came into the kill pen, the body score of negative. Like he was like negative six, according to Dr. Hanlon. And so if he laid down during the rainstorm and got like in the mud, you have to either get the tractor. And then she then posted that Gary drug him around alive by his legs and dislocated him. Well, one, you said he died laying where you took the picture with his head in your lap. So that's proof enough that he was dead when Gary dragged him off. And two, then she said, oh, no, Gary drug him here to intentionally like drug him with the tractor to drown. And I said, then where are the skid steer marks? Because the skid steer would have left tracks. So I've already been round and round with this bitch for seven years and I'm not going to keep doing it. I have seen things happen in the kill horse industry that would make a normal person go home and blow their head off. Anybody want to repeat what I just said? I have seen things happen in the kill horse industry that would make a normal person go home and hang themselves. I have been witness to things that I personally cannot stomach. Did I do them? Absolutely not. Did Jacob do them? Absolutely not. Did my father-in-law do them? Absolutely not. Has my father-in-law since been blamed and has animal cruelty charges for them? Yes. Because of women like her. Because they want to place blame on these situations on the person who buys the animal at auction. And there was a horse, one picture of a horse that is standing in the picture and she's like, this is it five days later. And it's like in the picture, it's a big fat horse. Five days later, it's dead in a mud puddle or in a mud pile. And she's like, it's the same horse. People called her out. That horse didn't get in that condition in five days. It's not the same horse. It is so hard for me because my father-in-law has cattle and other things. So, um, my next thing is, is that from seven years ago, there are pictures that I can tell you are real pictures. Some of them are not. There are some pictures that she posted that were not our, like our facility or actually their facility that I was going to a couple days a week. But what I will tell you is I have seen things happen. So here's the next thing. I don't blame her for any of the things that happened. Unlike Desi, they didn't happen because she was not there trying. They didn't happen because she was a piece of shit human being. She was just incredibly sensitive. And every little thing that went wrong, she wanted to personally blame me or my father-in-law for. She kept blaming me for not being there. She kept blaming me for not like getting off my ass and being there. And I told her, I can't. Like, I'm negative in my bank account. I have to borrow a vehicle when I do come. That's how long ago this was. This was in 2016. So, six years ago. So, I cannot, unfortunately, be there. I have to count change and borrow a vehicle to come there when I do come there. And when I come there, I video everything and try to see if somebody on the internet wants to buy it to get it out of there. Now, I will stand behind the fact that my father-in-law, my husband, when you buy a horse at the cell barn with, with issues and you get it home, 
they don't see it as, oh God, I bought it. Now I've got to rush it to the vet and fix its problems. They see it as, oh, I bought it. It has something wrong. I need to get it to slaughter. I need to cut its head off. We need to end its suffering. So what I can tell you is I have persevered through a lot to be where I am. And I had to stomach a lot of things that I wish I would have never seen to be able to financially be in the position to get the horses to a better place so that we never have to go through that again. I want to remind everybody that we're never going to stop buying and selling horses. It's never going to happen. You cannot stop us. So by hurting me, hurting my business, all you do is force it to where I can't afford the things that I have now. And the horses will have to just go back to Pitkin. That place is not built for horses. The mentality, the mindset, the culture in backwoods Louisiana is not the same as it is here in East Texas where there's lots of vets and lots of people and um, I have a beautiful facility. No horse will ever get down in the mud and not be able to get up and we have to take the tractors and try to hoist it out. That'll never happen again. Um, now, will I still get an emaciated horse now and then that might get down and die? Yes, but I stand by the fact that Those things happen before the horses come to us. And if you can't stomach that, then you don't need to follow any kill pin. So at the end of the day, I stand behind that I'm doing the very best I can. And Desi made a comment that was screenshotted to me that was like, oh, you can tell this horse that you bought was there because look how clean the barn was. You may have cleaned my barn, but you didn't take care of the horses. And I would rather have a messy fucking barn with someone like Jess and someone like Cheyenne and someone like Tori and somebody like Amanda and somebody like Nicole who now currently work there. Because those girls are outside doing the very most for the horses. They're not on their phone, like, just raking the shed row and keeping everything clean so that normal people think, oh, look how great this place is. All the while, you've never been outside to feed the horses one time when I'm in the hospital. So I would rather have a really messy barn and a really messy office and have really well taken care of horses. Now... I want to personally apologize. The lady that bought Hondo, and I'm actually going to call her after this video because I read her text to where she bought a horse she thought was four years old. He ended up being six years old. Um, she ended up finding the brand and finding his pedigree, and he was bred for reining, not barrel racing. And she said when the horse arrived, he had terrible shipping fever, and she was in there complaining. The horse that left my house was not draining snot. The horse that left my house didn't have shipping fever. I'm sorry that your horse arrived with shipping fever, but going from Warland, Wyoming cell to Billings, Montana cell to Texas in the heat and then going to Colorado to you all within a 10-day period is a very stressful life for a horse for 10 days. And I'm not surprised that his immune system caved and he got shipping fever. I'm not surprised. In fact, I would basically expect it. I would expect that. I tell people all the time that the best thing you can do is let the horses have two or three weeks at my facility to be turned out with very little human contact and a friend or two so that their body can readjust and their immune system can build up. I know the things I know from nine years of making mistakes. Now, when I bought Hondo, I told the story exactly as it was told to me when I bought him. If it wasn't the truth, I hate that. It happens all the time. I'm never going to say, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. It does happen. All the time people tell me a story about a horse that's not the truth. But fast forward, he was a beautiful, fat, shiny, slick, good animal that left my facility and I'm sorry that he got to your house and he was extremely sick and he lost a lot of weight and you had a $600 vet bill. It's not going to be the last time that happens from my facility because that's just the nature of buying auction horses. There was a lady that I was sitting with um, in September when we went to Billings and she had bought a horse at the March sale. 
and she's actually from Florida and she goes up two or three times a year and buys a handful of horses to ship to Florida. And she lost a $20,000 uninsured horse from the March sale because leaving Wyoming, I mean, leaving Billings, Montana in uh, March and going to Florida in March, the shock of it, and it was a non-sweater and it had sweat issues and then it, d it developed shipping fever and it was not sweating and it actually ended up getting super stressed out and had like organ issues and then it foundered and she lost it. And she was like, oh, you know, now I just insure everything before they leave the cell barn. So what I'm going to tell you is if you purchase livestock, you may end up with dead stock. And if it's more money than you can afford to lose, you can insure horses $1,000 and over. Your $1,000 insurance policies are very inexpensive, but my suggestion is to just insure your animal for the expenses that you've incurred if you absolutely feel in your heart that you cannot stomach the loss of your money insure them. That's what insurance is for. There is equine insurance on every corner. I want to encourage you that if you are spending more money than you can afford to lose, to take out an insurance policy and have Dr. Curry come out and do a vet exam prior to it leaving my facility for the insurance company, because at that point, you're covered. So if you buy a $6,500 horse from me and you feel like, oh my God, this is my entire life savings and if this horse dies, I'm going to basically be suicidal and go crazy, insure it. Insure your $6,500 horse. Insure your $2,500 horse if it's more money than you can afford to lose. I insure everything I purchase from my camera to my computer to my vacuum cleaners because I fuck shit up, man. Like, I can fuck a vacuum cleaner up in a day. I can fuck a computer up in a week. Like, I fucked the camera up. Like, my my Canon Rebel T6i um, is the second one I've had. If you're buying a purchase and you feel like you might mess it up or it might not make it or whatever... If you're worried about shipping fever, if you're worried that you're spending more money than you can afford to lose, insure it. Insure it. Insure it. All right, you guys, we have a star party. There's three minutes on the clock, and we need about 1,500 stars. So if anybody has any star packs, please send them now because we need about 1,500 stars stacked fast, please. Now, I will tell you that people have made the mistake of shaming cell barns. Now, the things that we could buy out of the cell six and seven years ago, cell barns no longer accept. So you're never going to see those body scores of negative, like Chance. The only reason Chance was through the cell barn and his condition is because he came directly from the county because he was a seized horse. Listen to me. Cell barns no longer accept horses in poor condition because they don't want to take the blame. The buyers won't buy them because the buyers are afraid to take the blame. What do you guys think that people that show up to the cell barn with a horse in the body score of one or below that get rejected, what do you think they do with that horse instead of leaving it at the cell barn? Because very few cell barns across the United States will let them sell because of the type of drama this girl is being wanting to blame somebody. Where do you think those horses go? They're dumped on back roads. They're hauled out to Papa's place with the cows and turned out to where they can die and nobody will ever see them. They are um, dumped, dumped out in the Kisatchee National Forest. Just the other day, Henderson um, called me and asked me if I was a rescue and I said no and they said they had six horses that somebody had dumped a mile past the cowboy church out in the woods and they were all the body score of one and did I know a rescue that could take them and I said no I'm sorry I, my husband's a kill buyer we don't we're not a rescue so where do you think the horses go when you create this much drama and people can no longer drop them off at cell barns to relinquish their rights to them that's what they do with them and so it's okay if you don't like the sight it's okay if it hurts you it's okay I've cried I have cried I've thrown up I've thrown up 
I've thrown up. Belinda, I've also seen the things that you've said about me behind my back, not only in like the hate type group or the hate page. I know you're here being very supportive during this video, but please remember that people do screenshot and I have seen the things you've said that are the exact opposite of what you're saying now. And there's several of you watching this that watch this. There are several of you who sent stars that I have also seen the negative things that you say. I don't understand that. I don't understand why you would come here, spend your money and rally behind me and support me. And then on in the exact same hand, go comment ugly things like it. That makes no sense to me. It makes me know that mental health issues are way beyond my capacity because I would never support someone, send money, comment on their things and be supportive in one hand. And in the exact same breath, be somebody that has been vocal um, on hate groups. Well, Belinda, I have the screenshots. I'll be happy to privately send them to you. And it's not to be ugly. I mean, I like you. I think that you mean well. I think you're a good, a good person. I just don't understand that. I don't understand the back and forth behavior, but you're not the only one. There's literally hundreds of people that do this and it's okay. It's just very bizarre to me, but I am not going to duck my head that I overcame where we were to be where we are today. Hello? Okay, if you'll send me a text message um, with just your name and information, we can set you up for an interview. Um, it's New Summerfield, Texas. Yeah, yeah, it's about 15 or 20 minutes closer to Henderson than Jacksonville. Okay, thank you. So. All I'm saying is, um, at the end of the day, I firmly stand behind that I've overcome things that you guys don't even know about to be where I am today. And we don't receive the amount or the severity of the neglect that we did in the beginning because one, my husband won't buy them anymore. And two, if we do, it's because they came from a cell that asked him to take them because nobody else probably bid on them. And my husband now knows like they're just going to take them down the road and dump them if he doesn't take them. So I just want to make it very clear that while I don't agree with everything that happens because it sucks. I think that we need to address the issue, which is people dumping horses at cell barns with underlying issues and not telling the truth or not disclosing the issues. Sometimes it's an accident. Like I think the lady from Florida, her $20,000 horse out of Billings, I don't think the seller didn't disclose that. I think it was too drastic of a change on that particular animal. Do I think that happens? frequently no I think it was a complete freak deal like it was a total freak deal like it it just was a complete freak accident weird deal that the horse just didn't handle the adjustments well with that being said will I buy horses from Billings and still bring them to Texas in March absolutely will I have that happen I hope not I mean I haven't yet and I also stand behind that I'd rather have a messy, like a messy barn because people are doing the most. Let me tell you a little secret about a perfectly pristine barn. It means nobody's doing anything. Horses aren't getting in and out of those stalls. Stalls aren't being cleaned. When you see a perfectly immaculate shed row and everything is swept and nothing is in disarray, it's because nothing is going on. At the end of the day, when you're completely done with chores, if everybody wants to pitch in and immaculately clean it, so you start the next day with an immaculately clean facility, that's fine. I'm not going to um, be upset about that. But if in the middle of the day I walk in the barn to take photos and it's absolutely pristine, why haven't the horses been out of the stalls? Why, where's the wheelbarrow? Why aren't you cleaning these stalls? Why, where, you know, why isn't there hair all over the grooming rack? Where are the grooming supplies? Why is everything spotless? So I've learned now not to question the disarray. I've learned to question the spotless clean. That barn stayed spotless clean while everything on the outside, nobody paid any attention to. 
that barn may have been spotless clean, but when I got home from the hospital, the water buckets were filth and some of them had been shit in. That, bot that barn may have been spotless clean where I would have videoed and taken photos because that's what the public would have seen and that's what Desi was worried about was just the appearance. But she hadn't fed a single horse outside of the barns because the barns were actually empty while I was in the hospital. So she cleaned it all meticulously. And then when I started right before I came out of the hospital, a couple of horses were put back in the barn, I think six. And by the time I got to where my oxygen, I could take it to the barn and drag it down there and set it up so that I could do a little bit and then sit on oxygen and do a little bit. I realized that the stalls had not been cleaned and the buckets were filthy and the hay had just been thrown on the ground. And I mean, so I stand behind I would rather my shed row be a mess and you see people bustling and stuff going on and the horses being tended to than for you to see an immaculate, quiet environment. That's not, that's not barn life. We're not an English facility with a staff of 20 with million dollar horses. So I don't have the um, amount of staff that one person can just go behind the others and keep things immaculately clean because they are really yeah, they, they really are working hard. I mean, Jess is outside with the skinnies and cleaning waters and bustling and coming up to help me video in between doing waters. And the girls are cleaning stalls and they're getting the horses on the walker and taking the slinkies on and off and doing all of the things that it requires to run a facility of my magnitude. And I have a very good staff right now of lots of people that you guys will never see because I will never open them up to the things that I've opened the last group of people up to. And frankly, it's none of your business when I restaff. I mean, it's just none of your business. So at the end of the day, what you see online is such a vague, small, tiny part. And I will talk about any part of it if you want to know the real story behind each part of it. Um... Jennifer, I don't know or care. As of the point that we gave that horse away, he was no longer our responsibility. That's the thing about it is when you do something for someone and you give them something, it's just not our responsibility. So my question is, is my staff can either have the place meticulously clean spotless and just focus on that, or they can be taking immaculate care of the animals and things get kind of messy. At the end of the day, we do our best to straighten it up so we start the next day with a clean slate. But that doesn't always happen, especially when we have a lot of therapy to do right before we're finished, because we'll do therapy up until the point that we have to kind of basically wrap it up. Because I'm not going to keep my staff there till 8, 9, or 10 o'clock at night just to clean. It's my facility, and it's not a public boarding facility. And I'm also not somebody that has um, owners. Like, I don't have people that own those horses that are going to walk in there and you know, I don't, I don't care. I don't care what other people think. Like I'm a horse trader and we deal with a lot of horses and we have a lot of work on our plate and I'm absolutely thrilled with the staff I have. And I'm thrilled with the mess that you see every day because feed sacks mean horses are getting fed. Messy shed rows means horses are in and out. Stalls are being cleaned. Water buckets are being dumped. Hay everywhere means hay bags are being filled. That mess is signs and proof of action and work and people doing things besides cleaning. And with a facility as big as mine, that's important. So, I stand behind what I do. If you don't like me or you don't like it, you can't shut me down. You're not going to force me out of business. Your opinion is invalid. I don't care. You can spend all day long drumming up the most horrendous things in the entire world. I saw them with my own eyes and I moved past them. And what, you, what I want you guys to see is that things from seven years ago, just look at the difference. You don't see horses coming in in the body score of one that get down in the mud and, you know, I mean, my father-in-law is gone and he's at a cow cell or something else. And now, if that ever happened, we would immediately have the tractor. We would have them up. I have staff that can stomach that. They would literally put the harness on and hoist it and get the vet there to shoot it. Because at this point in my life, I will shoot a horse. 
I'm telling you, we can shoot them, put them out of their misery and move on. Like, I don't hold on to suffering. I used to think in the very beginning that we could save them all. I would try to save horses' body scores of negative six that had pneumonia because by God, I was going to do it because God was behind me. And now I know, like, the person before us failed it and the best thing I can do is shoot it and move on. I, I felt like Chance would make it because he had a lot of strength and want to eat. But if I get a horse in that's really emaciated and we can't get them to eat and drink and they're just really not. I, I try to give them 48 hours to turn that curve. So like the horse that she claimed had tetanus, he didn't even make it 48 hours to turn the curve. He died. Now, what was going on could have been an overdose from racetrack drugs. It could have been... Um, PSSM, there is a multitude of things it could have been beside tetanus. So when I think tetanus, I think the third eyelid closing over and they don't make it as long as he did. I don't believe he had tetanus. I believe that he probably had like PSSM or he had been overdosed on the track on some medication and they just dumped him because they didn't want to have to put put any money or effort into him. So then he died before the vet could even get there to see him. Do I f think that that's good? No. Do I think he suffered? Yes. Do I think that it was a malicious thing on the cell barn or my father-in-law or even the girl that was standing there for seven hours trying to get him to drink? No. Do I think the person that dumped him off at the cell barn meant for him to suffer like that? I don't think they even thought about that. I think they were just unable to take care of the issue and they were just trying to relinquish themselves of the guilt and the responsibility without actually thinking of the long-term ramifications. Now, just because I understand why they did it, it doesn't make it excusable. They still dumped a horse at the cell barn that had underlying issues. They didn't disclose him and the horse died untreated as a result to nobody knowing what was going on because the vet couldn't get there fast enough. And anybody that lives in the country can tell you that you can have a horse colicking and dying and call five vets and not get an emergency vet out. I've had friends lose horses in their front yard to colic because they didn't have a trailer or a truck and no emergency vet would come out. And you don't look at that person and say, you're malicious and allowed your horse to die because you're irresponsible and you didn't get them. Nobody says that to those people. They say, I'm really sorry. And then they say vets suck and they start shaming vets. And how about at the end of the day, life is just unfair and shit's going to die. How about we just say life is unfair, shit's going to die. And what we need to do is just make sure that on, at my facility in Troop, Texas, we just do everything that we can to the best of our ability. So does anybody disagree with anything I said or does anybody have any questions before I end this live? Okay. Well, I'm going to take that as the majority of you understand and you also see the difference between Pitkin and you see the difference between Troop and you know why I worked so hard for this facility. And you also now see that I can see the worst of the worst and that I might cry or be upset, but I have the stomach to do what I'm doing. I can absolutely take the very worst. I can see the worst suffering in the entire world. I can rationalize how it happened. And just because I can understand how it happened doesn't make the behavior excusable in the persons who put the horse in that situation. And I will shoot a horse that's suffering. My job is the absolute worst. It's the hardest. I'm very reasonable. I'm very rational. I'm very calm about these situations. This is not a rant and rave and scream at someone situation. This, these are animals' lives that were innocent in all of this. These animals didn't ask to be put in these bad situations. These animals didn't ask to transfer hands. Just like the $20,000 horse that sold at Billings that got shipping fever like pneumonia and also wasn't sweating when it hit the Florida heat and all of that. But here's the thing. The owner who sold it at Billings never meant for that to happen. And I'm sure that they were absolutely devastated. The lady in Florida never meant for it to happen. Absolutely devastated. It happened. Huge monetary loss. So at the end of the day, what do we know about that situation? That even when you are buying 
the most expensive, well-cared-for animals, bad shit can happen and they still die because they're livestock. Livestock turn into dead stock no matter who you are. You are never going to own livestock and it not turn into dead stock. You might be the kind of person that sells your 16 or 17 year old horse before they get kind of over the hill into geriatric age because you feel like you don't want to handle the end of their life and that's your choice. But whoever buys that animal from you is eventually going to have dead stock. See, we're living beings, but eventually we're going to be dead beings because nothing makes it off of this planet alive. Nobody's here indefinitely. We have to stop being irrational and believing that just because we don't believe that slaughter is necessary and just because we don't believe that suffering is necessary doesn't mean that we're going to get around it. Like perfectly good owners lose horses to colic in their front yard and the horse suffered miserably for hours because a vet wouldn't come out every day. That happens 365 days a year all over the country to multiple people. Horses suffer en route to colic surgery and die on the trailer. Suffering is the inevitable in many situations and we have to stop being irrational believing that just because we can't handle the sight or the sound or the thought of suffering that it's not going to happen. People are going to get trapped in vehicles and burn alive. People are going to drown. People are going to get trapped in basements during storms and drown because their cellar door wouldn't open. There are going to be catastrophes in life where people die. We have a war going on where they're bombing innocent people and killing children. So, life is really ugly when you venture to that side of it. When you start talking about death and how it happens and the things that lead up to it, People want to preach to me about anti-slaughter. Why don't you talk to Putin about slaughtering innocent children all over Ukraine? No. No, because they're not animals and they're not horses and people suck, right? You love animals more than you ever loved humans. So those innocent children all over Ukraine deserve to die because our president won't step up and fight back? Because I understand we're part of NATO, but I can tell you that Trump wouldn't have stood for this. Now, I would rather have a mean fucking tweet and an irrational president who will bomb somebody than to stand by and watch innocent Ukraine children be killed at the hands of a monster. See, in a past life, I've done many past life regressions. I was a boy. And in one of my past lives, I was a boy that helped start the White Rose Movement. And that's a whole other side of my spirituality and my journey on earth. And I'm going to tell you, that I still have vivid memories of the Holocaust and of Germany, Nazi Germany. And it's awful, awful nightmares, awful times in my life of remembering things I wish I hadn't seen. So it makes sense how in a next life, I also have lived through what I consider a concentration camp for horses and have tried to build a paradise for those animals to keep them out of that. So it makes sense. It's just part of my journey here on earth. It's just part of something that is recycling itself because the same things happen, right? But I'd rather do horses than humans. Can you imagine Nazi Germany? I have very vivid, very real, horrible memories. Sometimes when I tell you I don't sleep and it's a lot going on, it's because of the memories. It's just there's a lot. And the war in Ukraine has sparked a lot of underlying, very vivid memories of war for me that I shouldn't have as a person that was born in 1986. So, I'm grateful that we were born in America to where we don't have to worry as much. With that being said, it doesn't mean that we want to stand by and be silent. So anyway, we're just not going to get out of this life alive. And we're also not going to fix all the suffering in the world. All we can do collectively is each and every single one of us just wake up every day to do the best we can by the horses presented in front of us. The horses put in front of me that are now put in front of you. There's so many things we can collectively do, but one of them is not to hate each other. One of them is not to bring up things from seven years ago to try to be a detriment to the current plan of action. I forgive every single person that worked for me that didn't do their job to the best of their ability because it's not meant for everyone. And not everybody has that work ethic and that ability and it doesn't make them a bad person. 
there's so many people that have worked for me that I don't like because of the way that they didn't do their job correctly, but it doesn't mean that I want to bash them and talk bad about them because at the end of the day, they're still a good person. This just wasn't for them. It's not their line of work. It's not what was meant for them and that's okay. And I don't understand why we can't agree that, hey, I don't really like this person. I think they did a shit job, but I'm sure they're a good human and lots of people are going to love them. So let's just move on. But what I do now is a cakewalk to where I came from. It's a cakewalk compared to seven years ago. I don't have to show up at my facility holding my breath, hoping there aren't dead horses laying around. I don't have to do that. And again, those horses didn't die at the hands of me or Jacob or my father-in-law. It was just that there were way more suffering horses coming in that they honestly were dumped off genuinely because they had really bad underlying issues. And to take the blame for other people's actions sucks. To take the blame like I'm a malicious monster that just let it happen or allowed it to happen over weeks and months, that's not true. Most of those horses came in and were dead within days, within hours. Some of them died within 24, 48 hours. We don't see that amount of suffering anymore because most cell barns will not take that quality of animal. They just will not take a horse that's not at least a body score of two. Okay, no worries. Okay. So please buy a raffle draw. It's $50. So there you go. Jessica, unfortunately, that's just not anybody's business if she works there or not. I'm sorry. I like you and you're not somebody that means anything malicious. We're just no longer subjecting my staff to the public. Like that part of it was my journey. So you got to hear that I was like, you said tacos and I said hired because that's part of my journey and it doesn't affect that person. So what if she came there and I hated her and I didn't hire her? What if she came there and I love her and she still works there? That's the problem is that that's the thing right there is that we just no longer, we just no longer subject my staff to the scrutiny that can come from being public. And I know, Jessica, that you did not mean that in an ugly way. You just are like me and you're a taco lover and you're like, yes, she's our kind of girl. And I'll tell you this, she's fantastic. But you have to remember on the flip side by asking things like that, there very well could have been a thing that I was like, oh God, she showed up and she was so this or she was so that. We're not going to do that anymore. There is a point that I get to talk about everything that my staff does without naming a specific name because it's my journey and I choose to share that. And I think Khloe Kardashian said it best when she said, there's going to be a moment that I don't want my following to think I'm evading talking to them about a very real situation, but I also want to protect the peace of the people, even if they are guilty in situations because they didn't ask to be a reality person. They didn't ask to be part of a reality show. For me, I signed up for this. I'm the one that gets my ass up here. I'm the one that chose to stand behind the rehoming effort. I'm the one that chose to rehome horses from Pitkin and the kill pen. So at the end of the day, I have to stand behind why I stayed even after all the amount of suffering that I saw. I stayed not because I agreed with the suffering. I stayed because if I would have left, nothing would have ever changed. I single-handedly changed the life of every horse that the Thompsons will ever purchase by buying my facility. And I stand behind that. Even if the haters hate me, they can't take that away from me. Because it's proof. And if it doesn't work here and I have to go back to Pitkin, I will keep rehoming horses. And unfortunately, the quality of their life will diminish 
and I will still keep doing it because they're going to still keep buying horses. So then people will say, pass the SAFE Act because that will save them. Except for that doesn't either because the suffering didn't start with the Thompsons. The suffering started with the people who dumped them at the cell barn, suffering with underlying conditions they're not disclosing. So, and stopping cell barns and shaming cell barns for selling horses that have issues or that are emaciated doesn't fix the problem because then those same people that were trying to dump them to let them be someone else's problem just dump those same horses off for free in the middle of nowhere to die on their own. So unfortunately, until you can figure out how to solve world hunger and also stop the war in Ukraine, I can tell you that there's very little in suffering that we can avoid. All we can do is do the best of our ability to rally together to change the life of every single horse that's get put, that gets put in front of us. I have nine months left to be able to um, fulfill all of my things that I need to have my place permanently. And I'm also having the opposition of people all over the world. Unfortunately, some of these people are in countries, other countries, and they just want to be very angry at me. They look at me and they blame me and they think it's me. They want to blame me for the suffering, blame me for the things that happened, blame me for the condition of the horses, blame me. First of all, I'm only one person that can do so much. And you have to remember that people like Desi, since she's so vocal, worked at my facility until she was fired. So if things were so bad, and they were bad while I was in the hospital, and they were atrocious when I got out of the hospital, which is why she was fired. And she even said multiple times publicly, I didn't plan my departure. I wish I would have because I could have sabotaged her. Anybody could come to anyone's facility and like dump a water tank over and take a photo and say none of the horses have water. So to, for, for me to think that if she had planned her departure, she would have further tried to sabotage is absolutely disgusting. With that being said, she didn't have to try to sabotage me. She did it with her actions while I was in the hospital. I have multiple people who received horses. And you know what? If Hondo was truly that sick when he got there, it hurts my feelings because it makes me wonder. I know when he loaded out, he wasn't pouring snot, you know? But again, is it something that my staff at the time had overlooked? I've restaffed since then for obvious reasons. And you can't say, oh, well, Tara, that's your responsibility. I am one person. And any business owner will tell you you're only as good as the people you hire because you can't do it all. I can't oversee all of those horses. That's never going to be physically possible. What I can tell you, and my track record proves this, is that when I start to see that there are big holes in any employee at my facility, I'm not scared to fire them and cover that job, including cleaning stalls. I mean, I have the blisters to prove it right now that I just popped from cleaning stalls that I will do their job until I can find adequate help to replace them. So it's not like I allowed, it, it was very hard on me. I considered Desi family. I would have done anything for her. It was very hurtful. And I do feel like she was very overwhelmed and I do take responsibility because when I got sick and I went in the hospital, um, it was just her and Joe and they both kind of were sick a little bit, not, not nearly as sick as I was, but Desi was struggling to hire help. She was not cut out for a management position. She had never been a manager prior and she'll probably never be a manager again. I still have her tag where she quit hideaway pizza to come to work for me. So we're not talking like an adult woman who was like a man manager somewhere and quit a very good job with a great background to come to work for me. She was working at fucking Hideaway Pizza. So having to be in the position to hire people and to... Um, it, I put way more faith in somebody that was not capable. Still not capable and still clearly has a lot of resentment and hate that she got fired because she won't stop attacking me. Hello? Hey. Um, okay, so you need to ask her, like, if she has to leave every day at noon, she needs to call me because what time did she get there? Yeah.
Okay. Well, I just, I mean, the thing is, is like, we just need to figure out something because if she has to leave by noon every day right now, it's not feasible for her to be on full time. Like it's, so you need, I mean, you're just going to have to tell her that. Like if it's something that we can work around, if she's going to work Monday through Friday, um, we don't, like in the winter months, we don't start, we don't start in time for her to leave at noon. I mean, we just can't. It's too cold. I mean, at 730 this morning, I couldn't see in front of me. No, I have somebody for that. So, I mean, she can strip stalls. I mean, did she start stripping stalls in the other barn as soon as she got there? Were you there at 730? Okay. Yeah, that's no problem. But no, I mean, she can... Yeah, it's, it's no problem. Yeah, no, no problem. But, um, I mean, she can start stripping on those stalls. But, I mean, you can just tell her that, I mean, it's not... Like, leaving at noon right now is... And, and like, if it's just going to be for this week and tell her rodeo is over or whatever. But, I mean, I need to... You know, I mean, what time is rodeo practice and what time does she have to leave? Like, those are just things that I can't run my business around. Like, I'm sorry, she's super nice, it's great, it's not anything personal, but I can't run my business around like a high school kid's schedule. So that's just something you need to find out exactly, like, what time did she... No, I already hired someone for that. So um, Amanda it will be there, and she will get the horses on the walker and do that, and she plans to stay long term and that's not something I need somebody you know what I mean you're, you're gonna feed the outside um but I mean you have to leave for California so and like she can't be there while you're gone for California so that's another thing that doesn't work like I can't hire somebody that tells me hey I just cannot work like if I say you know Jess has to go to California for you know five days I need you know I need somebody to, oh well I can't this day I can't that day I just I mean I can't do that so Jacob and I talked about it last night. I just need to know like what days can she work? What times can she work? And then I can sit down and try to decide like if our program will accommodate that. And like what can she do? What can she do in those time frames to make her work? Does that make sense? But I need I need for you guys to text me to sit down and tell her, okay, so what time can you be here? Because I mean, she's interviewing right now. This isn't uh you know what I'm saying? Like, so for me to make a position for her, what time can you be here? What time do you have to leave? And what days can you work? Unfortunately, you know, I'm not tractor supply or something where like you get your schedule and it's super sporadic, like, you know, and so the other, the other lady is more than well, you know, she, her and shy can come the whole time you're gone without any, any issue. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's necessary or else like I mean I mean I can't tell you no you can't go to California but I would have I mean it would come down to that be if it was up to her because she definitely isn't going to be there while you're gone so I just don't I really don't and I've never been a fan like it's not that I don't like high school kids and stuff but I've never been a fan of that because they want you to work around all of the shit they have going on but they're young and they deserve that. But that's why lots of places hire like part-time help for something. But this was never a part-time position and I didn't advertise for a part-time position. But she's wanting part-time work. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're, and that's what we need to figure out. Because I already have somebody in the full-time position. If she wants a part-time position, what time can you get here? What time do you plan on leaving? What can you get done during those hours? That's what I need to know. Okie dokie. Thank you. Where I am no longer struggling and where other people are is sometimes people that show up that want the job that have the best personalities are still not what's best for the job. And I am doing very good this time around about like you just heard, like I cannot work my business around her schedule. Wonderful. And Jess is so disappointed. I can hear the disappointment in Jess's voice because she loves this person. This person has the best personality. She's young. She's happy. She's chipper. But like she needs a part-time job, not a full-time job because she has like practice and all these things. And 
And you know what? It's okay. Like, I don't know if you just realized from that conversation, like, this is a wonderful person that I would absolutely love to have on staff, but I'm trying to hire for full-time positions and this is a person that needs part-time. That doesn't make my facility bad or this person bad. The disappointment in Jess's voice just now is very obvious because this is the person she likes the very best. But of course she does. They're very similar in age. They're very similar in personality, you know, but we're not hiring friends. We're not hiring people to be our friends. We're hiring people to be part of the staff to contribute to the growth of my facility. My facility needs to grow. My customers and their horses need to have the best care possible as much as possible. And sometimes those decisions are hard. Very hard. So it is what it is. And I choose to be public about all of the ups and downs. I choose to be public about all of my drama. I choose to allow people into my life for the good and the bad. But there's lots of people out there that didn't choose that. And I'm not, I can discuss it without you guys knowing who I'm discussing or without ever making them feel bad in any kind of way whatsoever. Um, and what we can do is see what days can you work, what hours can you work. And once we do those things, then we can see if there is a position we can make available. But I hope you guys see like, I've chose to be public. They did not. I've chose to share all of this with you. These people did not. So it's not fair for me to give you their names, their identity, bring them on camera, discuss it with you in a manner that we really deep dive down into things. That's not fair to them. It's not something they signed up for. And it's not something we will do again because this is a facility that's about the horses and not about the staff. And I'm tired of anybody that's ever been on staff pretending like, you know, I'm tired of them pretending like it was their show or like it should have been about them. It's not. It's literally a place for me to express how far I've come, to celebrate with those who have stayed with me the entire time, and to do the best we can by the horses in front of us. Now, I should be able to... Um, I think we found the actual part for today's video. Okay. All right, you guys, I am, many people have not had to run a business or actually hire in fire staff and have to say like this person did really, really, really terrible by my facility, but it doesn't make them a terrible person. Now let's move on. Like I can understand the reason why somebody did something or why a horse acts the way it is but it doesn't make it excusable and when it becomes truly inexcusable is when there's no effort to change my actions in the beginning of doing this were very different than now the things that i had to endure were very different than now and at the end of the day where I sit today is in a much different position and you can see how far I've come and that I did use the money from every, you know, that blood money and the money from this, look at what I created, look at where we are now, look at what the money got put into and it does better the life of the horses. Nobody can say that the quality that the horses of life, the horses receive now is not better than Pitkin. And you can say, oh, well, huh, it can't get any worse than Pitkin. Okay, but there's horses that still go to Bastrop every day. There's horses that still go to other kill pins every day that are exactly like Pitkin. And if you don't believe me, just ask anybody that's picking up at those lots. They're every bit as bad, if not worse, than Pitkin. And now, where they are now, I by far have the very best facility. My facility is very similar to privately owned horses. It's an amazing facility I try to staff the best possible people I can, and they all have compassion for the animals that they're in care of. So we just basically are to the point that, like we just need to realize how far we've come. So the horses are in a much better situation now than they ever have been in the past when it came to being purchased for kill by the Thompsons. So we're still bashing me, we're still mad, we're still, you know, carrying on and kicking our feet. I mean, 
You cannot say that I didn't put my money where my mouth was. You can't say that I didn't increase the quality of care for the horses. You can't say that the horses are not doing the, you know, doing the most at my facility. They are being worked with and taken care of. And, you know, we're trying to understand them and post live videos. If a horse bucks, you know it. If a horse has idiosyncrasies, you know it. We don't hide those. And I could do a video of Diablo riding and never talk about his problems. And nobody would ever, ever know the difference. I mean, everybody would just think he was such a good boy who rode around so good. Nobody would know he was a fucking piece of shit in the barn that we're having to overcome all these problems. And when I call him a piece of shit in the barn, that doesn't mean that he's permanently a piece of shit. It doesn't mean that I don't understand where he came from or why he acts like that. And it also doesn't mean that I don't personally work with him every day to overcome that behavior. So let's just move forward and let's stop. Let's stop like focusing on everything from seven years ago because it's not like that anymore. Oh, well, you were capable of doing those things, but I didn't do them. I didn't do them. I wasn't even present for any of that. I wasn't there. I couldn't be there. I financially couldn't be there. All I financially could do was scrape together enough money to go a couple of days of week and just video horses that needed to be shown to the public and then leave again. The care of the horses was never in my, my, was never mine. Nobody ever said, Tara, these are your horses to care for and you're responsible for their care. I was just basically took it upon myself to try to get them out of there. Now at my facility, my staff and I are responsible for their care and I try to enlist and trust and hire the very best staff that I can. And even sometimes that falls a little short, but it does with privately owned boarding facilities. Any boarding facility owner will tell you that they've woke up to no staff or to staff that just wasn't cutting it. And it's gut wrenching. And it's something that you just have to man up and know that as the facility owner, you chose to do this. So now it's your responsibility and it sucks, but it's something that you can watch over the last couple of weeks. I've more than done my part because it needed to be done. And so, I mean, I didn't cry in my car with my nails done and go, God, I just don't have enough staff and things aren't being, no, I just fucking got up early. You see how early I'm getting up. You see that I'm there. You see that I've been busting ass and now we have staff and today I'm going to get some much needed office stuff and trying to get some papers together. So maybe Monday we can get them mailed. I mean, not Monday, Friday, Friday, we can get them mailed. And I think that it's, um, great for me to be able to take a step back and then get the things done office wise that need to be done and banking wise and all the things I haven't been able to do over the last two weeks. So, um, I mean, and I probably will go get my nails done in a couple of days and be sitting in my car more often, not having to clean stalls again, because I have the people to do it and I'm proud to be able to have the finances to be able to pay people to do those jobs so that I can focus on other things. So well, Leah, none of your business. Let's remember, none of your business. I don't want to hire two part-time people to fill one time one full-time position. I don't want to do that. That's not something that I can I, I don't want to and I appreciate that you're like thinking for me and that you're like trying really hard to but I don't want to do that I want full-time staff members who want to be there who can and if I'm going to hire a part-time position it's going to be part-time pay and we're going to find the right job for that person so that's where we are I hope you guys have a really great day and I'm going to um go get stuff together and try to get a list of stuff that needs to be mailed. And anyway, I have a lot to do today. That's just not physical labor. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.